Welcome back to another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm your host, Stephen Roy Goodman. I'm here at ADA University in Baku, Azerbaijan, and we're going to be speaking about the economics of Azerbaijan and the region. I'm here with three guests, uh, Elkin Nurmadovov, who is the Dean of Business here at ADA University, Latifat Kanekesheva, who is a, a student here in economics, and Nihat Majidov, who's also a student here in, uh, at the ADA University. So welcome to all of you. Um, so maybe if we can start with you, Elkin. So in terms of the economics of Azerbaijan, are the economics of Azerbaijan different than the economics in other parts of the world? Yes, it's a bit different, I would say, in two ways. First of all, as you might know, Azerbaijan is a former Soviet Union republic, so we restored our independence in 1991. And until 1991, we used to be part of a centrally planned economy where all economic decisions were taken by the government. How much to produce, what to produce, who gets what. That's one difference. So Azerbaijan is considered a transition economy where we transition from uh, centrally planned to a market-based, more liberal economy. I would say that we have completed most of the past, but still there is an increased role of the state in the economy. And the second difference is, is that Azerbaijan is natural resource abundant economy. So most of our economic output is um, produced in the oil and gas sector, which makes us different from most countries in the world, I would say. And I assume you're trying to diversify that to a certain extent. Yes. In fact, that's the major policy priority of the country, to diversify the economy and to come up with new drivers of growth. In fact, it used to be the priority from day one when we had this oil riches, oil windfall, but it became even more important for the country uh, beginning mid-2014 as global oil prices started uh, falling drastically and this had a major you know, negative impact on the country. The country went through first recession in 20 years and then this need to diversify, this need to come up with new drivers of growth became even more acute. Fair enough. And Latifat, so we were just talking about 2014. That's approximately when you were starting to think about economics, I would assume. Yeah. And so what got you interested in economics? Yes, I think economics is a versatile degree. It um, uses um, logic, data, and reasoning um, to come up to sound decisions. And actually, first, uh, even at school, I had very uh, good math uh, skills. And since economics at ADA University is based uh, on mathematical and statistical skills, I decided to, use this, uh, to choose this major. Um, so this was the reason for my choice of uh, ADA University. But ADA also was my dream. And I always wanted to uh, find some department at ADA University that will suit my abilities best. And economics was, I think, the best choice for me. And Nihat, why did you get interested, become interested in economics? Uh, I think is, is what we need in this country a lot, a lot more economists, because we have some uh, economic challenges, especially after the oil price shock that hit our economy hard. So I think the that what interests me in economics. So fair and uh, efficient allocation of resources. This is what all economics is about. And I am always was curious about how we can fairly and efficiently allocate the resources that this country possess. So that was my, that was the reason why I, I got interested in economics. Well, that's really interesting because I'm interested in that exact same issue in terms of how we allocate resources. Mm -hmm. So my understanding is that one of the main economics principles is how do we decide as a society, whether it's in Azerbaijan, whether it's in the United States, whether it's in any other part of the world, how do we decide where resources ought to go and who makes those decisions and who ought to make those decisions? In, in economics, we have two extreme cases. One extreme case is when economy is centrally planned, a so-called command economy, where all those important decisions on production, allocation, and distributions are, are taken by the state. For example, we used to be part of the Soviet Union, and there was a so-called state planning committee based in Moscow, and that state planning committee decided, let's say, what kind of factories Azerbaijan will have, what will be the wages paid, where the supplies will come and all you know, interdependence between the former 15 uh, republics of the Soviet Union were decided in Moscow centrally. 
Now, in a, another extreme, there is a fully market economy, market-based economy, where decisions of production, decisions of allocation, decisions of distributions are taken throughout markets uh, by an interaction, decentralized interaction of millions of buyers and you know, sellers, and the wages in the labor market are determined accordingly. Now, these are two extremes, but most uh, modern-day economies are lying between these two extremes on this spectrum. Some more toward you know, government uh, role and other ones more toward market base. So Azerbaijan, I would say, let's say as opposed to the United States, even in the United States, there is some role of the state in the economy, right? But uh, it's very limited. In Azerbaijan, we still have a significant role of the state in the economy. We have important state-owned enterprises. Certain prices are regulated by the state, let's say on public transportation, on electricity and others. But compared to 1991, today is a completely different story. Of course, we have a much bigger role for market. But I would say that one of the top priorities of the government right now is to reduce the uh, footprint of the state in the economy because we want to become more private sector driven economy. But how do we do that in the energy sector, for instance? So if people have an expectation that electricity is going to be free or relatively inexpensive, mm -hmm. how does a government then turn around and say, well, you know, we're going we're gonna to ask you to pay more for that? Well, it's a challenge, especially uh, for uh, vulnerable segments of population and also uh, people not, let's say, of Nihad's or Latafat's age, but of more senior citizens, which are used to live under the uh, state kind of paternal structure, where everything is taken care of by the state. And these people are not used at a personal level to pay market prices for electricity, market prices for water. So usually the solution, and that's why it's very difficult, not only for Azerbaijan, but former, let's say, post-socialist, post-Soviet countries, to eliminate this sort of energy subsidies altogether because that leads to social unrest, that leads to backlash, people don't. So usually the path advised by multilateral institutions like IMF and the World Bank is to take, to, to gradually. You remove it, but at the same time you supplement people, you compensate people for that with some sort of uh, targeted social assistance, right? But this way it's very inefficient because no matter what your income is, you are paying for electricity, you are paying for transport at subsidized prices, right? So this is inefficient and unfair. I mean, if I have the means, if I have the financial means to afford the market-based electricity price, I should go for it, right? But now it's indiscriminate, everybody pays the low price, right? So there are ways to tackle this. Well, let's bring this to, to tuition. I assume you both pay tuition. Okay, and does the government subsidize some of that tuition here? Uh, no, government doesn't subsidize the tuition, but if we study for, if we have um, high performance, then we have some um, discounts. Or if we uh, are the best students, then we uh, have 100% discounts, so we don't pay any tuition. But that's from the university or from the, or from the country? From, that is from the university, but uh, normally the government doesn't pay subsidy to the students. But uh, yes, this is, the, this is the case in ADA. So in ADA, usually we don't have it. But in other universities of Azerbaijan, <coughs> we have the government subsidized places where the students can go on their, their study. Based on their performance, there are free slots and there are paid slots. So there, the government subsidized that. But usually it's based on the performance, yeah. so it's not just subsidizing. So I assume that this could lead to some social unrest, as Elkin referred to a second ago, because certain people probably are unhappy that they have to pay for the slots and other people would prefer the slots to be uh, the no. subsidized slots. I mean, the budget and resources are limited. As we said, that we should allocate it fairly and efficiently. So those who have high performance, they can easily get these free slots. But if you, do, if you perform not good, so I think it's fair that some people have to pay but through time, if you have, again, better performance, that that pay will decrease, so you will have some benefits, and I think that's fair enough. That's because otherwise students will not have any incentive to study if everything will be provided by the government, so I think that it's fair also. Yeah, to, to add on that, I mean, uh, yes, this is merit-based approach. That's why it hasn't created any uh, backlash so far. 
because those free spots are allocated to students who are performing the highest at the centralized state admission exam. In Azerbaijan, students are admitted to universities through a centralized exam, not by universities individually. And that's why we think that given the limited budget where the government cannot subsidize and make education for free for everyone, this is the only possible solution. Well, maybe if we can turn this to homelessness. Mm -hmm. uh, around the world, as I'm sure you all know, I mean, homelessness is a major issue around the world. Um, I have not seen a lot of homeless people in Baku. I'm assuming there are somewhere, but I have mm -hmm. not seen a lot of homeless people. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you do about people who don't have the money to, to buy a house or an apartment here? I am not uh, fully aware of the government policies. Of course, the government has been very keen as this oil money started coming in on reducing the poverty rates and the poverty rates uh, have been going down significantly and considerably and as Azerbaijan transitioned from being a low income country to upper middle income country and this uh, poverty rate reductions have been always hailed by uh, multilateral institutions like uh, the World Bank, right? But on a more uh, social and personal level, I would say that Azerbaijan is a very family-based society. That's why homeless people are rare compared to bigger countries or people from different cultures, because it's common that uh, Azerbaijanis would take care about uh, elderly, not only immediate you know, parents or kids, but also some relatives which have been deprived of certain you know, privileges in life. Let's say if someone's father or mother dies, then an aunt or an uncle would take care of tuition and all other expenses. So this social capital, you would say, this cohesion, I think takes care of that issue more or less. But of course, if the extent increases, then a more targeted government policies should be in place. Yeah. And what about people who are basically working very basic jobs. So uh, I've met some people who, are, who, who drive. I've met some, uh, you know, a bunch of people who are involved in the transportation world. But, you know, people, can they afford to have a middle-class lifestyle based on the income that they make from driving? If they drive a lot, I guess 724, but if it's only a limited amount of time, yes, you can make the ends meet but whether you call it a middle-class life by international standards, I doubt. But uh, a lot of people, you know, we've had uh, two years, two crisis years, right? As I said, uh, 2015, 2016 were very difficult years, and ever since the economy has been recovering. But just to give you some figures, let's say banking sector shrank by one-third. So we used to have 43 banks, but now the number of banks is 30. And you can imagine how many people having, you know, good white collar jobs in banks, getting decent salaries, now found themselves on the streets. What did they do? I mean, most of them probably found some other jobs, but they had to take even jobs as taxi drivers. Yes, standards of living went uh, down significantly, right? So of course the government uh, responded uh, actively and aggressively with certain stimulus measures, but uh, again, it remains to be seen uh, whether Azerbaijan will be back to life standards before 2015. Yeah. And what about people who are your age? So how do you see yourselves fitting into working in the economic sector of Azerbaijan going forward? Do you see yourself working for the government? Do you see yourself working for private sector? And what sorts of things are you hoping to do with your economics backgrounds? Mm -hmm. Or your economic training, I should say. So I, I've already started working part-time in, in the international company. So what I think, what I think about this, I think there is a trend now, especially among the people of my age, they start their career in the private sector, in international companies or in local big companies. They, in banks, for example, they take their that experience, this, this eff eff efficient workers, effective workers, they take that experience and then they move to the public sector. They work for the government, they work for the ministries or other agencies. So this is the trend I see now. 
So basically, I'm planning to, that similar kind of a career path. So I've started my <coughs> job, sorry. I started my job in the private sector. So I think over time, I'll move to, to the public sector and to use this economic background to, to make some important decisions, which will help. Mm, I'm actually not sure about my future career, uh, but I also think that maybe first I will start in the private sector and then I will move to the public sector later in order to gain some experience. But at the same time, I'm very interested in teaching. So maybe later I will become an instructor at ADA University. Or some other university. Or maybe some other universities. Well, actually, let's go down a little bit further if we could. I mean, so, so is there an economics curriculum on the high school level here in Azerbaijan? So could, you, could one in high school study economics? We actually have one subject. Uh, I'm not sure how it's right now, but during my um, years of schooling, we had just one subject economics, but it was not so, um, like we uh, just studied a little bit of economics, very uh, principles of economics and not more. It was, um, it's not so popular, I think, in our country. The study of economics is better in the university. Sure, and, and what about the difference in the United States? We often have a, a kind of split uh, for people who focus on microeconomics and people who focus on macroeconomics. Yes. Uh, do you have that same issue here? Well, both are actually a requirement in our curriculum. In fact, when we designed our curriculum, we took, we tried to take the best international benchmarks, but of course, uh, taking into consideration the local, you know, sensitivities. Let's say our degree programs are four years, where first year is sort of liberal arts general education where students acquire a breadth of knowledge in let's say public speaking, academic writing, uh, working in teams and then they start specializing in their main area of discipline. In economics that means that they are taking principles of microeconomics and macroeconomics type of courses in the first year but then in the second year they're going one step further and taking intermediate microeconomics, intermediate macroeconomics. And then in their third and fourth years, now they can specialize. Then they can choose among a different elective. So these are two paths that students take. But on top of that, they are, we, we also want them to become data savvy. And that's why they are taking a sequence called statistics econometrics, where they first get the theoretical background, through Mathematical Statistics 1, Mathematical Statistics 2, and then they work hands-on with data using different software in courses like Econometrics 1 and Econometrics 2. And so that's, and uh, the curriculum is very much the same as elsewhere in the world. Let's say students will tell that we use the same textbooks that, I don't know, Harvard students use. They are, medium of instruction is English here. But of course, when there is class discussion, we try to give examples from recent uh, episodes that happen in the world, but also locally in Azerbaijan. In, in economics, we often like to say that uh, we don't have controlled experiments, but we have natural experiments. So let's say the crisis of 2015, 2016, two devaluations decline in the living standards. In fact, from purely intellectual perspective, it was beneficial because it led to the rise in the interest in economic subject matter. And we had a lot to talk about in classes at that time. Fewer st students would, you know, sleep in class because of that. And what about, you, you just alluded to the, the discussions about this. I wonder, is, is this ever a public discussion? So is it a, I guess it's a political discussion to decide how a society uses its resources. I guess the question is, how much input does a non-government official have into that? So how much do the economists, whether it's in this country or any other country, how much mm -hmm. does an economist get to say, well, here's my recommendation, versus somebody who's actually making the decision about how much money we're going to put into a subsidy for electricity, for instance? Mm -hmm. who, how does that interaction work? I mean, certainly there is huge interaction because all politicians are advised by economists, and economists' advice is usually a product of intellectual and scholarly work, which is distilled you know, throughout millions of papers, you know, peer-reviewed conferences, and some ideas come up. 
uh, and then those ideas are translated into politicians' ears, either through formal agencies, like we have, let's say, Ministry of Economy, we have Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Taxes, State Oil Fund, then under the office of the president we have two economic advisors, one of them advises on innovation, another one advises on industrial policy. So there is no way that these economic ideas don't eventually get uh, into the ears of politicians. And then ultimately it's politicians, the elected officials, which have to make the decisions. But economists are good at presenting options. You know, on, on the one hand, on the other hand, as you know, one of the American presidents often said, please bring me one-handed economists, because economists are just offering options, but which uh, option to go with is the politician's decision. Which, which makes sense, and I've heard that joke about the one-handed yeah, economists yeah. as well. Um, and, and I guess it does make sense that, that in a democracy, uh, whether it's anywhere in the world, I mean, mm -hmm. somebody has to make the final call, and yeah. should it be someone who's elected by the people, I think that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. We only have a few minutes left. Are, are, am I forgetting to ask anything about the economics of Azerbaijan? I understand the, the mm -hmm. point about moving from a controlled economy to now, mm -hmm. but is there anything else that kind of separates the economic life here than we would experience in, in Canada or the United States or Mexico? As it can remember, we just mentioned, our economy is a mixed type of economy. We have some uh, elements of the socialism and some elements of the capitalism. Uh, so um, that's why it's um, obviously different from other countries in the world, like United States and Canada. Uh, but we are trying to diversify our economy right now, and we're trying to reduce the footprint of the government, as it can, Norma Madhav has just mentioned, uh, because um, oil reserves are our wells, and they helped us to uh, reach the economic growth, to reduce the poverty, to improve the economic situation in our country. Uh, however, oil reserves will not last forever, so that's why our country actually is on the right path and they're trying to diversify, especially the export portfolio of our country, as much as possible. The tourism is improving in our country. Uh, just last year, there was 3.2 million of people visiting our country. Um, moreover, agricultural sector is very improving in our country. Uh, horticulture, then silk production, cotton, and etc. So um, our economy is improving day by day. I think that we're on the right path and uh, we have used uh, what we have and now we are just trying to become even better. And um, also a lot of emphasis is put on the private business. I think the private business is one of the weaknesses of our country. Um, there is uh, not so much of private business, but um, government is investing in this. We have special fund that also help um, to, um, for entrepreneurship to improve. More than $2 billion uh, dollars of, uh, was invested into this sector. Uh, also, we have other um, social employment trainings that are uh, proposed by the Ministry of um, labor and social protection to population uh, where the people, they get some training on how to start up their business and how to uh, improve the business climate actually in our country. Um, so also uh, last year there was 1,000 people approximately who were um, involved in this program, but uh, this year they're planning to attract seven to 8,000 people into this program. And um, those people, uh, actually, who will have some interesting ideas, uh, they will be provided with materials and also with the equipment that will help them to start their business. So I think this will also be one of the ways to reduce the poverty in our country. We continue our discussion about economics in Azerbaijan, and I'm here with Fariz Ismail Zadeh, who is the executive vice rector of ADA University. Uh, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you. As you just heard in the first part of our discussion, we were talking about the command and control economy versus the free market. And what I'm interested in, I think a lot of viewers would be interested in, is how are you as a university helping students to appreciate the need for the free market, but also taking care of the needs of some of the people who are the most vulnerable in society? Right. Very good question. Thank you for this. Uh, we are a, a university which is cultivating young generation of 
leaders, young professionals for business sector as well as for public sector. And we believe that it's very important for our students to acquire important skills such as entrepreneurship skills. We are actually teaching entrepreneurship courses and we are uh, encouraging our students to think about uh, starting a business or running a business. Uh, because we are trying to develop business sector in Azerbaijan, basically. We are trying to uh, move away from the Soviet legacy of command economy, centralized economy. So we are moving towards free market and our students should acquire these skills. But at the same time, we are teaching them how to be socially responsible. Even if you are a, a manager of a large company or, or an owner of a big business, you also need to think about uh, some poor people in the society, you need to create opportunities for poor people, um, you need to develop uh, corporate social responsibility, uh, maybe invest some of the revenues of the company into environmental programs or poverty reduction programs. So we are teaching business skills, we are teaching how to become a successful business leader, but also we are focusing on social responsibility of the ma business leaders, how to uh, care not only about revenues and profits, but also care about the environment and care about the communities. That's the main focus of our university. And I think that that's probably right. Uh, but as you well know, that's an, this is an issue all around the world. Specifically, are there specific courses that you're teaching that are focusing on some of those issues? Yes. Uh, in fact, I was teaching myself a, a course called uh, Government, Business and uh, Society, which focused on relationship between these three stakeholders, how government should regulate business, how business should uh, try to help society. And we, in these courses, we focus on corporate social responsibility, how companies should uh, seek not only to maximize their profits, but also to focus on helping their communities, maybe uh, focus on human rights issues or labor rights issues, how to uh, provide opportunities for um, poor segments of population through maybe educational programs or community development programs. You know, Baku actually is a very interesting city. This is the city where oil industry has uh, started and, 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 and developed. And even at that time, uh, two centuries ago, uh, some of the oil workers, they lived in very bad conditions uh, without proper health care, without proper housing, sanitation. And the Nobel brothers uh, that came to Baku, they were the first ones to start you know, schooling and, and medical center for oil workers. So this tradition in Baku has lived for many centuries and we today we also, uh, in business community, we talk about you know, some uh, opportunities for workers, uh, what kind of safety standards they should have, what kind of healthcare standards should have. So these are the things that we discuss in our courses uh, at the university. Well, that's really interesting. I think we're going to have to leave it at that. Um, and I'm going to say thank you very much for having us here at uh, ADA University. And if you would like additional information about ADA University, please visit ada.edu.ez. And if you'd like to send a comment to me at the show, please go ahead and do so at higher education today at topcolleges.com. And thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.